Welcome to our next session for this particular class. We turn to the module that deals directly with truth. And the question you may ask is, what is truth? In our session on the ethical philosophies, we know that the different philosophers spoke to their truths or their particular perspective on what we should do or what a journalist should do in the context of truth making and telling the story at all times, regardless of whether it was the way in which it should be told, but really telling it from the perspective of the people in the context of truth making. We know that one ethical philosopher said that we should always strive to tell the truth, um, regardless of who is actually hurt by it. Another one said, speak the truth at all times, and of course, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Today, we may ask ourselves, are we living in a post-truth era? We know in the last two or three years, we are now going into three years since the COVID-19 pandemic. And the question is, where did the virus emerge from? What's the truth behind COVID? You know, what's the truth behind every single thing that has hit us left, right, and center? There has been a litany of sources of information and news as it relates to the pandemic. And so some of us, I'm, 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 sh I'm sure at some point or another, we have been confused about the sources of information and the truthfulness about the information coming from those in administration, from the information coming from those who would be concocting stories about it. But in today's session, we move to this whole notion of what exactly is truth. Before we get into the session proper, I'd like to share a quick video with you first to consider all sides of the issue. As we're still in a pandemic, we are not quite yet in a post-pandemic era, but there's still information and news out there as it relates to where exactly did this virus come from. So let's listen now to this particular video that pertains to truthfulness and the issues around COVID-19 pandemic. What about the pandemic origins? From very early on, there was informed reporting and circumstantial evidence. Sprung from a leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where Chinese scientists in the Daily Telegraph, in the Australian and on this station, she ended up writing the book on the, on the subject, subject and, and making make the documentary. What was going on in the Wuhan Institute of Virology? You're going to have to figure that out and you probably won't knowing you. An investigation into the origin of COVID-19. There's more than just smoke here. There's fire from different sources. Terrific stuff from Shari. Always was standout reporting. And here on this show, we were right into this stuff all along. Here's what I was saying here two years ago. Well, as you know, we have aired facts and informed opinions about the origins of the virus on this program over the past year. And much of the evidence has pointed to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But incredibly, elsewhere, especially at the public broadcaster, the ABC, they didn't follow Markson's reporting or investigate the story themselves. They got into what I call anti-journalism mode, and they just attacked the story. We're told another member of the Intelligence and Security Committee was appalled by the Telegraph's articles. And on Friday, two ex-Labour foreign ministers, Gareth Evans and Bob Carr, a regular China defender, joined the condemnation. It seems the US Embassy gave a confected report to an Australian newspaper inflating baseless claims that the COVID-19 virus was hatched in a Chinese laboratory in Wuhan. Pushing the Wuhan lab line in defiance of all intelligence assessments is just another nail in the coffin of US international credibility. Yeah, the biggest question in the world at that time, and the ABC did not want to know the answer. Let's start with Mike Pompeo and the president there uh, saying that, uh, or in Mike Pompeo's words, there's enormous evidence this virus started in a Wuhan lab. What do you make of that? Um, well, I've looked into this and other journalists have looked into this as well as scientists and there really is very little evidence. It's on the outer bounds of possibility, but really so unlikely that you could say pretty very, say definitely that it's not the case. Look, it was always obvious why the ABC hated the Wuhan lab link theory and it's as puerile as the simple fact 
that Donald Trump gave it credence. Donald Trump has specifically named the Wuhan Institute as the lab likely responsible for releasing the virus. Well, from wild claims about vaccines and the promotion of unproven cures, as well as competing baseless claims about a virus that was created in a lab and unleashed for nefarious purposes, the pandemic has been an opportunity for misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, the left didn't like where the evidence was pointing because they were deranged about Donald Trump. The Guardian, of course, ran the anti-Trump and, happily for them, anti-News Corp line. And the foreign editor at The Age and Sydney Morning Herald tweeted derisively about News Corp's exclusive reporting. Even former Prime Minister and now designated Australian ambassador to Washington, Kevin Rudd, weighed in, dissing the reporting on the basis that it was based largely on publicly available information. I bet Beijing was cheering on these Muppets. Indeed, there was so much about this story that was on the public record, it only made it even more deplorable that the ABC and the other green left media ignored it. And again, this is not the wisdom of hindsight. I was pointing this out two years ago when the Washington Post was finally starting to wake up after Trump had gone. To be sure, the Washington Post does not say definitively that the Wuhan Institute is the source, nor do I nor did Sherry Markson. But unlike Paul Barry and Beijing, I'm with the Washington Post. There is a lot of evidence pointing to this facility. The only way to prove this or disprove this is for the Chinese to allow full access to the lab, its staff and their databases. So much denial over this story, and still that denial continues. The Wuhan denial continued from so many on the left, so that after Markson published her globally significant book on the saga, What Really Happened in Wuhan, we had the bizarre situation where ABC media commentator Wendy Harmer, instead of congratulating Markson, she retweeted Chinese communist propaganda and accused Markson of risking World War III. Even just six months ago, the ABC was desperately running the Beijing line and targeting Markson and News Corp. So, has the mystery of COVID's origin finally been solved? The study's lead authors believe it has. Professor David Robertson from the University of Glasgow told the BBC he hoped the new evidence would correct the false record that the virus came from a lab. They'll grab any snippet like that they can because they don't like the facts of this story. It's just extraordinary, isn't it? Well, the big news today is that we are significantly close to the truth on this matter. And who seems to be right? The Trump-hating, journalism-denying, Beijing-defending, incurious green left journalists? Or those of us who checked the facts and backed Sherry Markson's fastidious work? Well, the Wall Street Journal, no less, has reported that a lab leak was the most likely origin of the COVID-19 pandemic, according to the Department of Energy. The Energy Department's conclusion is the result of new intelligence and is significant, says the Wall Street Journal, because the agency has considerable scientific expertise and oversees a network of US national laboratories, some of which conduct advanced biological research. Previously, this agency was undecided. Now its finding matches those of the FBI. This blows the Wuhan deniers out of the water. If we had relied on the green left media and our ABC, nobody, nobody would have known anything about this for the past three years. In fact, incredibly, they have desperately tried to shut down, shame, belittle and discourage those journalists interested in pursuing the truth. Thankfully, as Winston Churchill famously said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is, except on the ABC. Pandemic origins. All right, so that's a little expose there on truth and truth telling. And the question is still out there as to year and the origins. I don't believe that there's anything conclusive on where the virus started, um, even though that report came out in the public. And so the whole notion of truth and truthfulness remains up in smoke as it relates to that particular virus. In as much as we are aware that that's where it started, whether it started in a lab or in some other facility, 
it is still a matter of investigation um, as far as my knowledge goes where this particular virus is actually concerned. But really, it behoves the journalists to have some sort of ethical code to tell the truth. If it started there, tell the truth. I'm not necessarily in um, total, you know, conformity with or in agreement with this whole notion of a uh, lying set of reporters, but at all times, there are certain ethical principles that journalists should follow. So let's look at the ethical standards right now that really should obtain for print broadcast and online journalists. And we see that these standards really differ from the standards for persuasive communication, such as advertising or public relations, which we shall get to in the coming weeks. Now, the main goal of the news profession those persons who are working across professions, regardless of whether it's print or broadcast or online news, is basically to, to disseminate truthful information to the public. What is truth, you may ask, and defining truth is not always easy, because not everyone agrees on what is actually truth, and you will see that from the video that just played. And so definitions of truth have evolved over time, and we see that one of the earliest definitions was based on memory. Truth for the Greek was represented by the word aletheia, which included all that people actually remember. And so if, you know, Durkheim is the one who says that memory is unreliable, then we have a problem with this definition. I can see people having an issue with this whole notion of if the truth comes from your memory, and if what Emil Durkheim says is correct, then we'll have a problem with your memory being accurate. So information in that particular era was first passed on orally and not in written form. And so people's oral traditions, their oral memories is what they use to actually derive truth. Now, platonic and divinely inspired truth are really those notions of truth that emerge very early. We're in the platonic perspective, human rationality and intellect were seen as the bedrock of truth telling. And so for those thinkers, Truth is really noble only to the human intellect, um, and, and can, you know it can be verified. Like in my mind, I know that there is a God for that person who buys into this argument. But you know, how can I verify that there is a God? How can I verify that I have actually heard that voice without producing the sound coming from that voice for people? So human rationality and intellect correspond or come together. To actually tell the truth from that particular perspective. Now, in medieval times, this was taken by theologians to mean that only if you were in direct communion or contact with God as a priest, as someone of the cloth, then you are privy to the truth. It was only revealed by God or church leaders. In other words, if you weren't in that space, uh, that particular theological space, there is no way you could actually know the truth. And for some others, only the intellectually elite could actually know the truth, all right? So for those in the Enlightenment and Truth Theory, they felt that this has to do with research. It has to correspond to some external set of facts. And so when social scientific researchers emerged, they said, well, in the quest for truth, we know that gravity exists. And that's when the theory became law because we know that if it goes up, it has to come down, and that's the law of gravity, all right? That was theoretically tested. So for those persons who are looking for the truth, their argument is that it has to be supported by facts. If you want to know how people think as a result of being exposed to a particular, um, I would say, political perspective, for those persons who are in the era of enlightenment where truth is concerned, they're like, well, let's test it through some sort of verifiable data. Let's have a survey conducted to see whether we can draw that association between the truth that we're seeing exists between how we think and how we vote as it relates to how we actually self-report things when put to the test. So again, it has to do with external facts coming from the people. Now, truth using this definition, it has substance and it's verifiable because the results will actually speak for themselves when it comes to how people have actually reacted to the questions. Truth can also be perceived by the senses, which are harnessed through the intellect. Now, when it comes to enlightenment and truth in the context of journalism, this definition of truth is the basis for the journalistic ideal of objectivity and the libertarian view of the press. 
meaning that the journalist at all times should seek out truth, seek out truth in a way that says that I am not necessarily standing in the way of truth, but I'm giving the facts as they are provided to me by multiple sources. Now, objectivity really speaks to being able to determine facts from opinion, being unbiased, fear, and being detached from that issue. From listening to that video, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me that it's just very difficult for someone to be detached. And as much as they're trying to present themselves as being in the middle ground there, you know, just being that person who is near right or wrong, but somewhere in the middle, it is not necessarily reserved for every single network, every single reporter, every single producer, because there's always this notion to take on the perspective, the persona or the culture of the news establishment. And so objectivity and being detached becomes very, very difficult for that person who was bought into the culture of the organization, but it's still an ideal, you know, the reporter is supposed to be objective. And so detachment is necessary. And so these principles really of detachment and being clear and unbiased and being able to determine fact from opinion departed from what was called as a yellow journalism or sensational reporting or muckraking. Back then when journalism had just really evolved as a practice in society. And so libertarians perceive people as rational, unable to discern the truth in the context of objectivity. You would recall for those of you who are journalism majors, that when it comes to very early theories, Walt Lippmann's theory you know, of the press, this whole notion of the magic bullet and humans being irrational and not being able to ward off those particular ways in which the press were feeding us with information, the various, and I say were because it's multiple news outlets. Back then it was just the print media. And then of course, you know, the, the audio or, you know, the, the broadcast media came after and then television. Um, for them, for Lippmann, in terms of, you know, public opinion, his very seminal work, it was, you, you, you're not rational. You believe whatever you're fed with. But libertarians came along and they're like, no, um, there is my ability, there is your ability to discern and to peel apart the information that is coming in such a way that we can discern whether it's really unbiased or whether it's biased. We can discern whether it's coming from a truthful place or whether it's really something that is, uh, you know, outrightly um, meant to deceive the public. All right. So our rationality is what the objectivity really feeds into, all right? And so if a person fails to be objective, then libertarians really believe that we can see through that particular person's proclivities of not telling the truth because we are rational thinkers. And so such views, libertarian views reside at the foundation of um, whatever the freedom of the press has been, what it, is, what it has evolved into from the time of the First Amendment and the principles around uh, the ability to tell the truth, the, the ability to have access to information and the freedom of the press in the context of guarding the whole you know, practice of governance. So um, if we go back to that very first amendment lecture, you would recall one of the values of a democracy um, of, of, of the first amendment of a reporter is that ability to seek the truth out and to be able to tell it unimpeded by those who hold power in society. And so journalism and objectivity by rationality really feeds into what the goal of the press really is to present information unimpeded by those in power. And this has to do with the democratic norms and principles of a society that is governed by a very strong media fraternity. And so if you look at other societies that are not necessarily democratic, um, you know, autocratic societies, you know, such as uh, is occurring in parts of Europe and Asia, um, th those societies that aren't necessarily very open to journalists telling all sides of a story. For those of you who've been watching um, how the war in, in, in Ukraine has been um, taking place in the last two years, it's just entered into the second year, you will see that there's been a wanton denial that there's a war actually taking place. And there was a journalist who actually came on screen and she's like, why don't you tell the people the truth? It's a war that is actually happening. Um, there is conflict. We know that there's economic fallout happening. We know that there's a lot of collateral damage. We know that quite a few persons have lost their lives, who've actually um, gone to the battlefront to save Ukraine. 
we know that quite a few persons have exiled from the country to save themselves. And so that's not democracy playing out right there. That is a situation where one country has gone into a neighboring territory. And so you don't necessarily have the information as it's unfolding unless you get something coming from um, the Western press as it relates to what is happening on the ground there. So you, you're not going to find the Russian press telling you exactly what is happening with the arsenal um, that is being executed by the Putin administration because they don't necessarily follow the principle of an open, unimpeded press and information segment of society or section of society. So the goal of the press really, when it comes to um, democratic norms and principles, is having that free flow in such a way that the government is not interrupting the broadcast and saying, you should actually cover what I say and you should not get the other side. Having all sides, it's really difficult to be um, an autocratic type of a society with a press that is not free. And so the press really in, in, a, in an objective setting produces a marketplace of ideas where there's a range of information for people, for audiences to choose from and to decide for themselves which ideas are actually good and the ideas that will rule their well-being. Now, pragmatists will challenge, and they have challenged objectivity in the past. Their belief is that the perception of truth really depends on how it is investigated and by whom. A pragmatist may say to you, well, if you look at Fox, you're not necessarily getting the truth. Someone who's on the left side will say, well, if you look at CNN, you're not necessarily getting the truth. So for those persons who are pragmatists, they're like, well, you know what? It really has to do with who is bringing the story and exactly how they're framing the story and whether they have a particular orientation. If they're oriented to, to the left, you're going to get the story from the left perspective. If they're oriented to the right, you're going to get it from the right perspective. So it's a matter of the relativity of truth. So for them, truth is relative to what is the perspective of Democrats versus what is the perspective of Republicans. So again, pragmatists will say to you, it is about your ability to discern and to peel off the multi-layered nature of news that is coming in such a way that you can discern whether it's objective from the perspective of the mouth of the persons who are actually bringing the story. If you're following in the news, you will see that Rupert Morda, who um, is the owner of Fox of the Fox Network, he admitted that there were persons there who were peddling issues around an election fraud from the 2020 polls. Um, after all this time, you know, this is an issue that has gone to trial. Um, this is something that is still pretty much in the public domain as it relates to the truth behind the electoral outcome and the 2020 issues that happened um, that led to what we discussed in the very first thread um, in, in terms of the storming of the Capitol and the whole thing behind, the issues behind whether there was a theft and so forth, all right? So truth really for pragmatists is this whole notion of, it just depends on who is in power, it just depends on who has the following, and it really depends on the perspective that they're actually bringing. I don't know that I agree fully with the pragmatists, but really it behoves us in society, it behoves people, it behoves audiences to be able to take the mask off and to be able to check from among multiple sources to form their own conclusion. Now, the great Noam Chomsky, who said that journalists really are engaged in manufacturing consent, he said that it's the duty of journalists to tell the truth and that journalism means you go back to the actual facts, you look at the documents, you discover what the record is, and you report it that way. I can see Noam Chomsky actually speaking to the Watergate scandal story that came out in the New York Times, and of course, those issues that led to the, um, you know, the, the First Amendment that led to this whole notion of allowing journalists to tell the truth to the people so that they're reporting it as it occurred back then with the Vietnam War. So truth in this regard, as it relates to what Professor Noam Chomsky is actually positing here, is the fact that we're not adding to, we're not taking away, but the journalist is really to discover what the record is and to report what's in the record to the people. Now, the postmodernists will counter what the pragmatist perspectives um, were previously in the, in the slide before. And so postmodernists said that truth in itself has no meaning. It's quite confusing, isn't it? They're saying that context is everything. So for the postmodernists, if, if it's a moral context, 
it is about that. It's not necessarily about whether the person actually took money and spent it somewhere on a vacation with women. It's not about wine, women, and song. It's about the context of the particular issue. Is it a context where the person misused funds? Is there a misappropriation issue that is wider and larger than the truth of that particular issue? And so <laughs> you will find that if you're looking at these particular arguments coming from pragmatists and postmodernists, they go right back to those ethicists and those very early ethical philosophies around the truth, making sure that whatever it is that you're actually reporting on has to do with the, the need for people to know and their want to know, and of course, the greater good of society as well in terms of what the arguments are here. So it's about context, says postmodernists. So regardless of the problematic nature of objectivity, it basically remains the basis for standards of news, reporting and news. Now let's go to accuracy. Now accuracy has to do with facts and context, which are foundational to everything that news reporting is all about, all right? It is about fact-finding and it's about providing context or background to the story. It's about verifying the information to ensure that accuracy is vital. And again, borrowing from what Noam Chomsky actually said, he says, you know, you, you've got to go to documents and report it. You cannot necessarily concoct anything, but you've got to verify, go back, check your sources, and make sure you're reporting in such a way that it is accurate. Now, the emphasis within the accuracy and truth telling, we are getting that from the Society for Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. And as you've seen in the video, you will see, if you have not yet accessed all of the lectures, you will see that there are over 400 codes, all right, um, that journalists subscribe to. Whether or not they actually practice them, it's a totally different question altogether. But reporters, says the Code of Ethics um, for the Society for Professional Journalists, they should seek the truth and report it, seek to minimize harm to subjects, function independent of interference, or refuse gifts, and of course, exercise transparency and accountability, meaning basically that a reporter should not be so prideful that they're afraid to admit that they uh, really committed error. Um, so if you see someone, you know, who's on here, here who says, well, um, you know, I'd like to retract what I said, I'd like to correct, that is really being honest, that is being humble about a mistake, you know, it could be an honest mistake. You've got somebody's name correct, you've gotten the context out of context, you go back and you admit law, you admit fault, all right? So it's this whole no notion of transparency and accountability, full disclosure about the story. When it comes to functioning independent, it is about not necessarily taking one side and leaving out the other side, but it's making sure that you're above board, the report is above board, that story has taken into account all sides without any fear uh, or, or any favor when it comes to taking one side um, of the story. And then, of course, they should be tenacious um, in the context of how they're reporting. The obvious should be uncovered, in the sense that not because it's looking red, you should just write it as being red or report it as being red. There has to be a dive, a deep dive beyond the official sources. It has to be investigative. And for our next module, you will see. Uh, that undercover reporting really goes beyond the obvious in the sense that there are times when you don't have the official sources at your disposal. There is this whole notion of um, apprehension on their part, or there, there's just avoidance in terms of speaking with reporters. And so the investigative reporter who will actually take the nose dive goes beyond the official sources, and they will get to the bottom of the story. We say that a journalist has to have a nose for news. All right. And they must also be given the resources to cover important news issues, not just the regular um, Jane and John stories. And so out of all of this, you will find that tenacious reporters have been the ones who brought to light issues around social movements, what is happening in climate, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. It is not just saying this is what is happening right now in society. It is about saying these are the issues that have been affecting society for years. There are layers upon layers upon layers of issues that have permeated, that have caused people to rise up, that have caused social movements to erupt as a result of things that have been affecting communities um, within society for a number of years. 
all right? So this is how tenacity has really helped people to understand that there is a breaking point, there's a tipping point where certain types of stories are concerned. Now, there is a group called Reporters Without Borders. I might have touched on that before, but it's good to know what is happening in terms of other societies and how they have become very investigatory and investigative. In the next session, I will tell you about Nellie Bly, um, Elizabeth Jane Cochran, and how she has really been one very vital, um, I would say, source, somebody who has been a trendsetter in investigative reporting and, in, and uncovering important issues um, as it pertains to people in society. Now, dignity and reciprocity, these are very, very, very important as well when it comes to the ethical standards in news reporting. And this has to do with the values that reporters should take around with them when it comes to reporting about societal issues. A reporter should leave the subject of a story as much self-respect as possible. And this ethical standard that pertains to dignity and reciprocity has to do with the nature of the coverage that you will give to that particular community or person. Case in point, if you're actually covering a story with someone who's been raped, they're already the victim of rape. You're not covering the story in such a way that you're assigning some sort of blame or shame to that individual by highlighting, oh, this is how the person usually dresses. So perhaps they're looking for that particular type of response. Not necessarily so, all right? Uh, there is a freedom that is associated with the way one dresses in such a society, in such a culture. And so if you're leaving the subject of a story as much self-respect as possible, it means that you're not stripping them of their dignity because they came forward to tell their story, but you're telling the story to raise awareness about a possible predator so that other persons who may not necessarily be aware can be on the lookout for that person, not on the lookout for the victim, to further victimize them or to shame them, but to be on the lookout for that particular um, issue that is happening in society. So dignity is very, very important because that person has come forward as someone who's been victimized, or even eyewitnesses might have come forward and they trust you to not necessarily strip them of that particular dignity. The next point to note is really the need to diligently seek out subjects of news stories to give them the opportunity to respond to allegations of wrongdoing. Give all sides an opportunity to respond to wrongdoing. Now, as you prepare for your ethics in the news presentation, you will go through these ethical standards. The Society for Professional Journalists Code of Ethics becomes very important for you to understand what is happening in the context of news coverage and giving all sides an opportunity. If you're selecting a story, for instance, such as what is happening right now um, in the context of you know, the politics of you know, January 6th, the politics of what happened in terms of the elections, did the network give all sides? Were all sides given the ability to respond to allegations of wrongdoing? Was Fox balanced? Was CNN bought balanced? Was ABC balanced? Was MSNBC balanced? Using the same issue, you can actually pull from those issues to check to see whether there was diligence in terms of how the news stories were actually reported from, a ethical perspective, from an ethical perspective, all right? So that is where that assignment comes in. It's going to help you significantly to think through the ethics of the coverage in that particular perspective. Then of course, there's a need to treat others as you wish to be treated. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Does that sound familiar? And of course, the ethical philosophers, all right? And the need to minimize harm. Now, again, ethical standards have to do as well with equity, seeking justice for everyone involved in controversial issues, not just the plaintiff, but the defendant. Is everybody getting an equal chance, an equal time on ear? Is everybody's issues, you know, are all the issues being resolved at the same time? Or are we just seeking justice for the community that is complaining? Are we not seeking justice for the organization that is pumping resources and the people are actually destroying facilities? Is every single person, is every single side being heard or being justified in the story? And of course, the need to treat all sources and subjects fairly. This has to do with our very early module on those all purpose figures versus those persons who are not necessarily, you know, you know, public figures or they're, they're, they're actually in, in oblivion in society. They're not necessarily a very public. They're not there. We don't know them. You know, it's the person in the street versus the 
producer, the actor, the politician? Are we giving the politician two minutes? And are we giving the person, the man in the street, Jean or John, two seconds of airtime? Are we treating all sides fairly in the coverage? Do we see that coming out in news? Is there equity across all of the network that we're actually viewing when it relates to treating subjects fairly? And if we were to look at the current situation that is happening right now with the Alec Baldwin case, you know, are we giving him more prominence than somebody else who, who is actually involved in an issue um, as it relates to you know, working on a set or as it relates to a hit and run, for instance? Um, is there more you know, credence as against um, you know, treating with a subject that is not as prominent in society? So this, is, this comes back to treating all sources fairly as it relates to the news aspect of equity. And then, of course, there's the need to support the open exchange of views, including those you do not agree with. Can we say that for sure that this is what is happening across all networks? If there's a topic such as elections and the text, or if there's a topic such as you know documents at the White House or in somebody else's home, is the news establishment, whether it's Fox or CNN, are they giving the Democrats and the Republicans, those persons who will come on as commentators, equal ear time? equal space in the newspaper, equal space on the blog, or on that particular online platform, whether it be podcast or whatever. Is there an open exchange of views in such a way that you're not shutting down one side as soon as they come on air and you are saying, well, viewers, we're sorry that we have to cut the program right now. Is that the practice that we're actually observing? All right? So equity speaks to justice for everyone, treating all sources and subjects fairly, and supporting the open exchange of views, even though we may not agree with our own personal views, in as much as we need to bracket and be very unbiased. And then, of course, there's this whole notion of reporters valuing social cohesion and acting as part of the community. If a reporter goes into a community and they decide to do mobilization, they're not valuing social cohesion. Yes, communities may be aggrieved about an issue that is affecting them. Let's talk to the issue of water. All right, there are broken pipelines. There is no potable water. The reporter goes into the community and says, yes, you guys need to just get yourselves together and protest, you know, behave terrible because this is not what is supposed to be happening in your community. And it's because you're, you know, minority or whatever it is. If a reporter does that, they're fostering social upheaval instead of social cohesion. What the reporter should be doing is going into the community, hearing the people and speaking on behalf of the people to raise awareness so that whoever is responsible for restoration, they see the news and they go back in. At the same time, you want to make sure that you're giving that particular entity or establishment an opportunity to speak to the people through the news establishment to say exactly when can we expect betterment in our lives. So social cohesion, the journalist as a peacemaker, as someone who is a humanitarian, bringing social justice to the community is what this particular ethical standard speaks to community, all right, bringing the people together. And of course, independence really conflicts with this value because journalists will be required to be free of obligation of any interest. And if it is that that particular community is being plagued by an issue based on one of the sponsors of the news, then it becomes a problem for that particular reporter, that particular establishment to be someone who's fostering social cohesion. What do we do? We make sure that as far as possible, we get both sides around the table, speak about the issues affecting the society, because the public has a right to know what is happening. And we've got to, journalists have got to avoid conflict of interest. And I usually say we, um, because I still consider myself someone who's actively engaged in not just teaching it, but forming it. I do write, I still write. And of course, avoiding conflicts of interest, we love to see. This has to be a value that we're seeking to achieve in the context of community or being humanitarians. Now, diversity. Diversity is a part of our class. It's a part of our very final module. But journalists should cover all parts of the audience fairly and adequately. As you would have gone through your diversity piece, you know, thinking through how you're actually covered, what you see in the news, and this is going to really stimulate your curiosity as it relates to issues of stereotyping. Have you noticed that journalists who might have gone into communities not actually understanding the community, reporting using a certain lens? Like, we're reporting from X community that is known for gang on gang crimes. 
uh, that is known for X or Y, have they gone into the community really devoid of stereotypes around race, gender, age, religion, sexual orientation, social status, and other, um, you know, very variables, other stereotypes, you know, how does a journalist describe people of a certain religious orientation? Those religious zealots, how do they describe people within the LGBT community? Well, we're here today with those persons who do not believe that, you know, somebody is actually born a certain way or whatever this what language is actually used when we hear the stories around somebody's social status. This beggar, this wealthy man, or those people over there, how are we framing or seeing reporters framing stories as it relates to gender, race, age? Or those young people, those uh, particular groups of people who are feeling so entitled? And so these are things that we see every day. We discourage just those types of things. And the Society for Professional Journalists discourage this type of reporting. But yet we have those discussions, really, all right? These are, I would say, discussions that can seep into practice if we don't take a step back when it comes to the ethical standards in news. So as you think through diversity and as you think through stereotypes and as you see them manifested in the news coverage, ask yourself, how is it that race, gender, age, religion, sexual orientation, social status, or even someone who is in the particular category of, of, of having a disability, how are they represented in the news in relation to diversity and understanding diversity and understanding that society is made up of different people, all right? Journalism should counter stereotypes rather than reinforce stereotypes. So these are issues that are very, very important for us to consider as we think through the ethical standards of reporting in the context of news. Now, there are a couple of readings that you're required to actually go through the ethics issues and cases when it's objective reporting, irresponsible reporting. As you think ahead about other modules that deals with undercover reporting, this reading is going to put you a step closer to really discerning exactly whether there has been a breach of the ethics or whether there has been no way out for the public to know except if that particular reporter went undercover. So I will stop here for now and then for our next session, we're going to actually be looking at on the cover reporting.